Okay, gentlemen, if you remember from last time, is this, uh, is this charts part two or charts part three? I think it's like two and a half. We're going to call it the third, the third day that we talked about charts. You still ought to have a piece of paper, the slide we left off from. So you ought to have that piece of paper that has these words on it. And we talked about VOR, DME, and flight service station. I want to add a transmitter. So I want to add, and I don't care where you put it. Oops. Well, if I can get this to do what I want it to do. NDB. So NDB stands for three words that I'm going to ask you probably at some point. Non-directional beacon. In case you have trouble spelling non-directional beacon, I'm going to give it a try here. Non-directional beacon. This is also a, a navigation transmitter. Just like a VOR, it's bolted to the ground. Just like a VOR, you can navigate to it from wherever you are. Obviously, you have to be within radio reception range and that you can navigate away from it to go somewhere. Interestingly enough, there are specific NDB transmitters, non-directional beacons, on the ground that the FAA has put down there specifically for aviation use. But you can also pick up AM radio. So you're going to write down NDB. Some of them are FAA transmitters, and some of them are AM radios. You need one of the peppers? Yeah, some of them are AM transmitters. Is this the one that you were looking for yesterday? I'm getting better. So I remember those L'Oreal uh, hair color commercials. I'm not getting older. I'm getting better. And that's that's for it was it was an advertisement for for women to color their hair and get the gray out. So I use L'Oreal on my beard. Is it working very well? I'm getting, I'm coloring gray. Coloring it gray. It's working great. It's working. It's working great. So an NDB, just like a VOR, is a transmitter. It's bolted to the ground. Except the FAA has some of these NDBs, and they're the ones that you use for official navigation. But an NDB, the receiver inside the airplane, will pick up AM radio stations. So there's some website. I don't know where it is. It's not an FAA website, but you can look up the latitude and longitude of AM radio stations, and you can plot them on your chart. And you can navigate them to them. I remember the RD just outside of Dinuba, the great city of Dinuba. Has anybody ever been to the great city of Dinuba? Okay, all right. I've had, I used to go there once a week on Sunday mornings. They didn't have a Foster's Freeze. They had a different kind of a drive-in. If I was lucky after church, my grandfather would take us out for a root beer float. But that's another story. All right, so that completes what I wanted to get off of this slide. All right, so we're going to look at some miscellaneous things on this chart. Uh, we're going to take a peek at a couple of them on here, and then I forgot to bring the charts. I'm going to go grab them. We're going to look at them. Uh, airspace we're going to cover separately. The next thing we're going to look at is Victor Airways. A Victor Airway is a place where IFR airplanes are flying. So who can remember? Let's see. I forgot my shaker doodle. So we'll just Jonathan, since he raised his hand. Did you have a question, Jonathan? Yeah, it's a thin blue line. And sometimes they have like V on it. In any case, that's, a, that's not every place IFR airplanes can fly, but that's where a lot of them do at low altitude. And so who? what is air traffic control responsible for keeping who from hitting who? IFR airplanes from hitting... Other IFR airplanes or helicopters or blimps. Blimps can file IFR. Balloons can't file IFR. Hey, Josh. So it's nice to know where a lot of that traffic is. So if you're going to cross it, you're going to look in both ways. It's like coming up to, coming up to an intersection out in the middle of the country and nobody has any stop signs. 
So we're going to take a look at that. Military training routes, and I know you can't see this, so I'm going to I'm going to go get the charts. MTR, you can write that down. MTR is a, is an abbreviation for military training route. see how far we can get with these. Well, I'll open it up to Fresno. Open it up to Fresno and see if you can find a military training route. And if you don't know what a military training route looks like, let's see, where is an MTR on the legend? An MTR on the legend. There it is. If you look on the legend, it's in the very bottom left-hand corner. It's not up on the screen, but it's on the legend. It's a thin gray, and it could be IR or it could be VR. IR stand means that it's an IR route for military aircraft, and VR means that it's a VFR route. All that really means for us is that if it's VR, military aircraft aren't going to be on it if it's instruments. Found one? Where is it? Can you describe it to the rest of the class on how to find it? If you find Fresno Airport and you go to the left, you'll see some a dark gray, a thin gray line going uh, from the upper left to the bottom right, and it's IR203. So see if you can find IR203. See this line, this gray line right here? Look at this gray line right there. See if you can find IR203. That doesn't look like Fresno. That looks, oh, look, by down Fresno. It's this gray line right there. You turn it around and see if you can find it. 203. You're, you're getting close, Louis. Here's IR203. You found an IR route. Okay. So can you find Fresno, Luis? Okay. So here's an IR right here. See, it says IR203. So IR does not mean that it has to be IFR conditions for them to be flying through it. It just means that if it's a military aircraft, they can be flying if it's IFR. But the military has permission to fly as low and When I was in the United States military and I was flying on a bomber, we would take off, fly to aerial refueling, pretend to pass gas, and get fuel from another airport, and then we'd fly down on an IR route. And if it was flat terrain, and it was during the day, we would fly at 400 feet AGL, we'd fly at 400 miles per hour, and the airplane usually weighed around 400,000 pounds. And I was in an ejection seat that the navigator manual said, do not delay ejection below 2,000 feet. Well, when the B-52 was designed, it was designed as a high-altitude bomber. Besides, if you have your choice, no ejection seat or downward ejection seat, a downward ejection seat. In any case, if you're coming up on an IR route, a military training route, whether it's IR or VR, you need to look at case and realize that aircraft could be on that route as low as planes can fly lower than that 400 feet. Okay, let's see if we can find a Victor Airway. In fact, there's one that goes next to Selma, wasn't there? Selma Airport, Victor 2-3. In fact, Victor 2-3 goes right smack over Selma Airport. Remember, we were looking at Selma Airport, and their traffic pattern altitude was two or 300 feet lower than normal. I think it was at 800 feet AGL instead of 1,000 feet AGL. And we figured out why, because there's an instrument navigation route 
right smack on top of it. So you notice it says V. V is for Victor. Who has not found Victor Route 23 that overflies Selma Airport? So here's the airport. So it's, this is kind of a light blue shaded, and this is a light green. So that's trying to tell you where other airplanes might be. Now, is there any legal requirement to call somebody up and ask them to go through there? No. But that means you really need to be looking out the window a lot. Okay, let's look at some obstructions. What's the highest obstruction within 10 miles of Fresno Airport? And you're going, how do I tell if it's higher? If you look at the Fresno Airport, you notice there's a couple of things that look like M's. That just means multiple towers. And you'll notice the one by Fresno Chandler Airport. There's two towers, and it says 660, parentheses, 367. That's telling you 660 is the top of the tower on your altimeter. So would you say that Fresno is a congested area? The people, how high do you have to fly, if you're going to fly over that tower, how high do you have to fly over it? At least 1,000 feet. So how high would you have to fly? Yeah, 1,000. Number in parentheses is the height of the tower AGL, ground level. But since we're not going to fly down that low, we don't pay that much attention to that number. We're more worried about what altitude do I need to see on my altimeter to make sure that I'm legal and in a congested area, I got to be a thousand above the highest obstacle if I'm within how within two thousand. I got to be a thousand feet above it. So look at the set of towers in the south uh, east of Fresno. There's two towers down there. How high are the towers above ground level? It's less than an inch away from those two towers we were looking at. Yeah, how high are those two towers above ground level? And it might be more than one. That means that there's more than one. 325 feet above ground level. Okay, just for fun, let's go all the way over to Reedley International Airport and then go pretty much straight east of there about five miles, you see uh, multiple towers over there. How high are Yeah, if you go to Reedley and then go to the right. Well, 1273 is how high the top of the tower is above above how high are the towers above ground level? And 50. So that's pretty good towers. So let's say you're cruising around. That's out in the country, right? It's either sparsely populated or not congested. So I'm just going to stay 500 feet above everything. And I'll be really happy, right? Four white and red towers right next to each other with lights and stuff. And guy and guy wires. It's the... Because you can see the towers, and you go, oh, I'm going to miss it. And then your wing hits one of the wires, and it crumples your wing, and you tumble down, and then you hit the ground, and you're squished into seven pieces. Have you ever seen that movie, Squished into Seven Pieces? Yeah, it hasn't been made. They haven't, they haven't made that movie yet. All right, so you're out in the country. You're flying around just for fun. You're 600 feet above the ground, so that means there could be a 100-foot farmhouse or a 100-foot windmill. And you're still more than 500 feet above or away from everything. But wait, those towers are 850 feet above the ground. So you could hit it. See what I'm saying? So this is why they put obstructions on there, so you'll know better. Or correction, so you'll, be, so you'll know for it. If you to Reedley Airport and go straight north of it about an inch, which is about six miles, Go to a private airport called Harris Ranch. And if you go north and east, that's up and to the right, you'll see Pine Flat Dam. Looking at that diagram of Pine Flat Dam, can you tell where the actual concrete dam 
is. An actual piece of concrete. It ought to be a black line. Okay, so it's hard to make out because that lake and that dam, dam is pretty small compared to the lake. Look far over to the right of the chart, about, uh, about 10 inches to the west of Fresno Airport. About 10 inches to the west of Fresno Airport, there is a big Ohonkin Lake over there. About 10 inches to the west. Seven, about, how about 70 miles west of Fresno Airport? Yeah, so if you keep... There's a big reservoir over there. Anybody ever driven past that on the way to Santa Cruz or Monterey? How big is that dam? That is one heck of a dam. And if I, if I wasn't trying to not say the D word, I would say that was some kind of a dam. Look how big the dam is. You can see how long that line is. You think you can see that from there? How long in miles is that dam? It's at least three. In fact, while we got this out, I want you to look at, I'm going to go back a slide and I'm going to show you. We're going to look at some latitude and longitude. Let's see, what's a good color? Red. All right. So what I, if you'd look at your chart, and let's go back towards Fresno, and we'll notice that there is a longitude line going up from Lamore Naval Air Station going up here. So please don't write on the chart. But that's a longitude line, and you'll notice there's a tick mark, and then there's a bigger tick mark. That is five nautical, that's five right there. One, two, three, four, five right there. All right. Each one of those tick marks going north and south is one nautical mile. A nautical mile, just like a nautical mile per hour, is 15% more than a statute miles per hour. A nautical mile is 15% more than a statute mile. But generally in aviation, we don't even, I take that back, except for visibility of, of from clouds and junk like that, uh, we stay. We do everything in nautical miles. Don't ask me why we're still doing statute miles visibility. So I could look at that and look over at that dam, which I don't have a picture of, and I could estimate the length of that line of that dam is about three of these tick marks. So if that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, hey, here's another tick mark. This tick mark is ten nautical miles from right there. Now this longitude line right here sorry this latitude line all the latitude lines are flat and all the longitude lines are really long. Remember the longitude line goes from the true north pole to the true south pole. The latitude line goes all the way around the earth. Which one of the, I know this is a trick question which, one, which latitude line, here I'll call the name, which latitude line on the earth is the longest latitude line of them all? Remember, the latitude lines are flat. They go left and right. So one of those lines of latitude is longer than all of the other ones, Brian. The equator, yeah, at zero degrees north of the equator. That one's zero degrees north of the equator. And every degree up, latitude up, it's 60 nautical miles. So you measure 60 miles, and you would do one degree north. And go up 60 nautical miles, and it'd be two degrees north. And again, and again, and again. And then at some point, can you find a latitude line that's labeled? Look north of Fresno Airport. There is a latitude line about 15 miles north of Fresno Airport, 10 miles north. It says 37 degrees. Look, go find Fresno Airport, go about 10 or 15 miles north, and running left and right, 
is a latitude line and it's labeled 37. So that line going left and right is 37 degrees north of the equator, or you could say it was 37 times 60 miles. So now we, we don't even need a ruler or anything. We could actually just measure, mark a distance and slide it over to one of the longitude lines going up and down because that's now our miles. Now if we got the equator where the, long, where the latitude tick marks on the, are the same as the longitude, the tick marks that go left and right get smaller and smaller and smaller. So for mileage, we can only use the one service. That's how we measured it. We actually got out a pair of a compass with two points on it, and we'd put it between two spots, and then we'd stick it over on the tick marks and see how far it is. And in fact, since we're doing this, don't go away. I just had a really good idea. No, I'm not going to dance. Don't get your hopes up. Let's just see how many of these we have. Wow, exactly the same as we have. No. All right, so... I don't care about the plastic. You can tear the plastic off. I'm never going to. I don't care about the plastic. I don't care about the instructions either. Forget the instructions. Real pilots don't need instructions. So this is called a plotter. This is called a plotter. And you'll notice at the bottom long line of the plotter, it probably it has miles on it. And you notice it says sectional. But you notice if you look at it, with the zero is not lined up with the end of the plastic. The zero is about three eighths of an inch end of the plastic. You see how the zero is right there? Okay. All right. So just for fun, measure the distance from the middle of the Reedley Airport to the middle of the Fresno Airport. Fresno. You know what? Let's do Fresno Chandler, the red, the magenta airport on the far side of Fresno. The Reedley Airport to Fresno Chandler Airport. From center to center. And how many nautical miles is it? From center to center. I have an 18, I have a 20. Show me your 20. Try Fresno Chandler Airport, the magenta airport. The one that's covered up by all this pencil. So did anybody else get 18? 18 18-ish nautical miles? If you look, uh, if you go past Naval Air Station, Lemoore, Lemoore Naval Air Station, you'll find there's two airports near Kalinga. There's New Kalinga Airport, and there's one that's uh, a closed airport. Measure the distance. It, go to Lemoore Naval Air Station, put your finger on Lemoore Naval Air Station, and go and west about 15 miles and you'll see the new Kolinga Airport. It's south and west of Lemoore Naval Air Station runways. It's about 15 miles. It's mostly west. We'll just pick the middle of the two runways. First I want you to find the little magenta airport that says New Kolinga. Yeah. Sixty nine. It'll tell me. Let's see. PR nineteen and oh, right pattern. Two seventy five, six twenty five. Oh, five thousand feet. See, like here at Reedley. There's Reedley. It's uh, 3,300 feet is the longest runway. So here at Fresno, 
9,500 feet is the longest runway. Here, 3,500 feet is the longest runway. So, yes, 1,000 feet at the New Kolinga Airport. Okay, who has not found the New Kolinga Airport? I want you to measure the distance. Center Airport to Center Airport from Re New Kolinga. Measure the distance between Reedley Airport, the center of the airport, to New Kolinga Airport. How many? I hear a 51. Does anybody else get a number? A 59? Okay, that's different than 51. I have two 51s, 59 going once, going twice. Wrong! Oh, sorry. Man. 58. Are you going to Reedley Airport? Are you at New Coling? New Coling, yeah? Oh, he's, he's, uh... He's starting from the wrong way. He's going from 80, he's going from 85 all the way. No, the scale is different. Oh, so you're on the side that says statute miles? You want to try the side that says nautical. Because we're in the Navy, just like those uh, village people, dancers, singers. In the Navy. Don't, don't. Yeah, don't pump Well, if that was mine, I would take a black felt marker and mark through it. 51, okay. Yay, 51. Okay, well, I think we've done enough with with that. Question? Do we get to use the flight computers? Yeah, for a dollar. Each day, each student. I'm just kidding. I can't accept money from students. You have to, you'd have to pay me under the table when nobody knew about it. Okay, let's see. We've already covered uh, magnetic variation. We've looked at the chart two to four weeks ago and looked at magnetic variation. Let's see. We've looked at a dam. Let's uh, see if you can find a railroad that parallels next to Highway 99 going north out of Fresno. Going north out of Fresno. There ought to be a two highway. There ought to be at least one railroad leaving Fresno going north and slightly west. So you'll notice the roads don't have tick marks on them, but the rail tracks have tick marks on them. I remember my first cross-country, my instructor, and I flew to Bakersfield Airport. It was really easy. There's a freeway, Highway 99, that goes down there. It's really hard to get lost if the weather's good. You can fly IFR. I follow roads. Sorry, I have to say that. That's an aviation thing. If you don't know IFR, you're a stupid pilot. That's not really IFR. IFR is instrument flying rules. Let's see. Uh, uh, somewhere along the freeway, somewhere near Stockton, is an airport called Lodi Airport. See if you can find the Lodi Airport. Tell if it's... Uh... Can I borrow this? Here, I just want to move it up here. Here's Highway 99, Modesto, Stukton, Stukton, Stockton. Is this Stockton? Does that look like it's... Okay, where's Lodi? There's Lodi Airport. That says Lodi Airpark? I'll be darned, because see, it, that airport's right next to the freeway, and they do parachute jump. Drop, jump zone dropping and and they don't and they don't have a symbol. So I, I was hoping I could find a I could find a symbol. Yeah. All right, fine. They ought to have a parachute drop zone symbol there, but they don't. So I'm not going to feel bad. All right. Okay, I'm going to keep going on. So here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to look at this slide, and I'm going to tell you the things you need to write down on this note side. So Victor Airways. You can fold your chart up, but we'll probably open it up here before the day is over. He's absent, so I really need...
Bertson, one more plotter. Okay. So here's what you need to know. Uh, for Victor Airways, that's IFR routes. And MTRs is an abbreviation for military training route. And two kinds. There's IR routes and there's VR routes. And these are these these routes, whether they're military training routes or they're Victor Airways, there's nobody to call up and see if it's busy or not. So what you have to do as a VFR pilot is what? Yes, lo observe. Look out the window a lot. We already talked about obstructions. Of the, the towers, for instance, have two, lab, two altitudes. The one in parentheses is the height of the top of the obstruction above ground level, and the big bold one is the height of the obstruction MSL. And of course, that's the one we're going to pay attention to the most. At the end? Okay. That's the end. That's terrible. That means we have to go to next. Look, it's a handout. So I guess I had to practice. Eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, sechs, sieben, acht. Oh, yours is way better than my picture. You drew it over the summer? I, I, if I had a gold star, I'd give you a gold star, Jonathan. But I'm, I'm, I'm lacking a gold star. All right, so Section 04D, airspace. There are many kinds of airspace. There's the first kind of airspace, or the classes of airspace, and that's the trickiest ones because there's A, B, C, D, E, G, and you see there how there's no F airspace? F is the forget it. Use class F airspace. Because ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, which started back, I don't know, what was it, the 30s, 40s? I forgot that class. It's a college class as soon as I took the first and everything. The, IK, the International Civil Aviation, you're laughing because you don't forget anything. Okay. The International Civil Aviation Organization states as a member, and about 10 or 15 years ago, we changed our airspace classifications to match ICAO, but the United States, the FAA, said, you know, you know, we're just never going to have class F airspace. We don't really care about it. So if you go to a foreign country, there might be a class F airspace. The nice thing is there are books you can buy to tell you all about F airspace. Actually, when you go into class F airspace, you have to curse every time you talk to the air traffic controller. You've got to say the F word. Okay, I got one chuckle, so thanks. So we're going to talk about the classes of airspace. We're going to talk about special use airspace, which I think are the most interesting ones. And then, of course, the dreaded temporary flight restrictions. So just for fun, you can write in. Well, we'll when we get the TFRs, I'll tell you to write temporary flight restriction. So this diagram right here is a very, very basic outline of class A, B, C, D, E, and G airspace. Class A airspace, I, that's my favorite airspace because to me it's the easiest one. In fact, the lower you get, farther away from A you get, to me the harder it is because there's more details to remember. Class A airspace is up there, and, and don't write this down, I'll tell you when to write it down. Class A airspace starts at 18,000 feet and goes all the way up to 60,000 feet. 60,000 feet, and that's approximately 60,000 feet because everybody in Class A airspace, they set their altimeters to 2992, so it might be a little lower than 18,000 or a little higher than 18,000. Question? What's after 60? It reverts to Class E airspace, and that's where the SR-71 used to fly, and that's where the current secret, unannounced, completely denied UFO technology based spy planes that the United States Air Force flies out of Area 51. They take off, they climb up through 
uh, Alpha Air, Class A airspace above 60,000 feet, and then you don't have to talk to anybody once you get up there. You're just on radar, and they can see you going Mach 5, five times a time. Unless you're a UFO, and then you're going like, zoop, zoop. you go like three states in one second. No. And it freaks out the air traffic controllers, but they don't care because they don't have to talk to you because you're above 60,000 feet. Isn't that the way it works? So, yeah, what's, up, what's above six, flight level? And you notice this says FL. That's because it's not really an altitude. You're not setting your altimeter setting so your altimeter reads correctly. You're just setting it to 299 or 2. And then everybody between 18,000 feet and flight level 600, which is about 60,000 feet, everybody sets their altimeter to 299, 299.92 because guess who's flying up there? Cessna 152 is doing 100 knots. No, of course not. Constructs 18,000 feet, there's only half as much air. The engine won't even produce half as much horsepower at 18,000 feet. So who's flying up there between 18,000 feet and flight level 600? Airliners and business jets and turboprops, things that go past 200 miles an hour, usually they're going five or 600 miles an hour or five or 600 knots. So if you had to set your altimeter setting within every 100 miles, you'd be setting your altimeter setting every 10 minutes. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. So everybody just sets it to 299 or 2. So, but we don't have to worry about that as a private pilot because to get into Class A airspace, this is one of the reasons I like it so much, is you can't go there as a private pilot because you have to have an instrument rating to get there. And you'll, you'll no one will ever rent you an airplane as a private pilot that will get up to 18,000 feet. And that's almost completely true. It's pretty close to true. All right. I guess we'll cover it. We'll just, we'll just dive in here a little bit. So look at all So that if this looks nice and confusing, that's great. You're now you're scared and you're really worried and you're going to try really hard to take lots of notes. Nobody's denying that. Okay. All right. We'll get back. We'll look at the chart. So here we are. So we'll come back and look at our charts to look at some airspaces. So Class A, and that's actually a mistake. It says flight level 180. Cross out that flight level 180. It actually is 18,000 feet. If the, if the altimeter setting is such, well, I'm not going to cover that. In any case, on the test, if you put 18,000 to 60,000 feet, that would be fine because nobody expects private pilots to get them. All right. You got to have an instrument rating. You got to file an IFR flight plan. Your airplane has to be legal to fly IFR. But more importantly for us, everybody up there is flying IFR, and therefore everybody has to have an instrument rating. And therefore, and we can't get that high anyway, so we don't really care. Except the fact that someone might ask you on your check ride. What's class A airspace? That's the airspace I can't go because I don't have an instrument rating, and it starts at 18,000 feet and above. Oh, okay. That'd be enough. And nobody will rent me an airplane that will go that high. Because 29.92 is a standard day altimeter setting, and it's always a standard day of They had to pick one number. I guess they could have picked 30.00, right? But everybody already knew because they were scientists. You heard of them? Okay, because there were scientists that figured out the standard day, the average day, the typical day. At sea level, the pressure was 29.92 meters of mercury. What we should have done was taken that and just squished it down and said, okay, that's 30 inches of mercury, and then it made it even. But Of course, you know there's like three countries in the whole world that don't use the metric system, and we just happen to be one of those silly countries. All right, so I guess you don't have to write down anything that's not already there. All right, I think Class B is one of the most interesting it actually has the most amount of details, but flying in a Class B airspace, that's fun. Because then you're like all excited, you, you drink your caffeine or your Red Bull. And of course, I don't recommend you drink Red Bull. But in any case, Class B airspace is where it's busy. Class B airspace is where it's busy. Most of the time, the very top of it goes from, it goes from the surface all the way up to 10,000 feet. And it's typically described as an upside-down wedding cake. If you look at that diagram in the bottom left-hand corner up there, you'll notice it's sort of like a weird-looking upside-down wedding cake. It does hit the ground, usually a 5- or 10-mile radius around that busy airport. In California, there's at least three, one, two, three Class B airspaces, San, uh, San Francisco International, 
There's a, cl- a set of airspace on top of that. There's a set on top of Los Angeles International, and there's a, a Class B airspace on top of San Diego. And I think that's called Lindbergh Field. I think they changed the name and named it after Charles. Does anybody remember Charles Lindbergh? He's the first guy in a balloon in 1791. Nobody's disagreeing with that. Nobody. One person is disagreed. This believes that Charles Lindbergh did not die in a balloon in 1791. Okay. Okay. At least one person knows better. So, if you want to fly into this airspace, if you want to fly into this airspace, uh, you have to have a two-way radio, and you have to have a transponder that'll transmit mode C. So, I want to talk about mode C. If you fly those simulators out in the lab, over on that little tiny screen, there's a radio, and it usually shows up as showing 200 or 1200. Remember, you can each of those numbers can be set anywhere from 0 to 7. 7700 is an emergency. 7600 is lost communication. I can't talk on the radio, or you can't, I can't hear you. And 7500 is my mother-in-law is hijacking the airplane from the back seat. She has a BB gun to my head. So. Huh? Yes, the part about the BB gun was a joke, but the 7500 was correct. I'm glad you're asking. If, I, if I'm forcing you to think about what I'm saying and you're trying to decide whether it's true or not, then I'm doing my job. 7500 means that your aircraft is being hijacked. Oh, they're going to call the police and follow, and they're going to have some authorities on the ground when you land. Hopefully, they'll have a sniper that'll go right past the bullet, will go right past your ear into the brain of the sniper of the of the hijacker. That's only in the movies. The problem is the glass on the windshield on airliners is pretty thick. But on my airplane, it's really thin, so a bullet would go through the plexiglass on my airplane. It's only an eighth of an inch plastic. All right. So you got got transponder. So that transponder with those four digits, it transmits two things. It transmits that four-digit code so the air traffic controller can tell who's who. They give you a code that's 3435, and they give you a code that's 3791. And on their scope, his airplane says 3791, and over there his airplane says 3451 or whatever I said. Okay. But in addition to that, the transponder has a... Has a uh, a line, a tube, connected into your static system. Remember, the static system goes to your altimeter. So your altimeter, if you set it to the correct altimeter setting, what does it read on the altimeter? It reads its indicated altitude, and it reads, does it read AGL? It reads MSL. Okay. But you have to set the altimeter correct. But, so that means that the prep of your static system isn't perfect. It needs to be corrected. All the transponder does is take that temperature inside your static system, and it transmits that to the nearest 100 feet to the air traffic controller radar and therefore to their computer, and their computer sets in the correct altimeter setting. So I want to be really, really clear here. You're going to write this does not transmit the altitude that is shown on your altimeter. It does not transmit the altitude that shows on your altimeter. It transmits the altitude that's inside your static system. It transmits the altitude inside your static system. And then the ATC computer corrects it so they know what altitude you're at. Yeah, you know that static source, your altimeter is hooked up to the static port? On the altimeter by spinning that little knob on the altimeter. Okay, so your transponder doesn't know what you've spun in there. So it's transmitting the altitude that's in there. If I'll tell you what, if you were if you took your altimeter and spun the Colesman window around to 2992, that's the altitude going to air traffic control. Yeah, 
it's giving you the, it's give, it's transmitting your pressure altitude. But how often do we have our altimeter set to 2992? Almost never, because it's usually not a standard pressure day, and so we have to adjust it. So I just want to be clear. People think, oh, the transponder transmits your altitude. No, it doesn't transmit altitude. It shows on your altimeter. Because what if you set it wrong? Air traffic control will still know how high you are. You could take that Colesman knob and spin around and be off by 1,000 feet, and air traffic control would still know how high you really, really are. Because it's, al- it's getting the altitude that's inside the static system. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if, if they give, let's say, let's say you take off when you're an IFR flight plan, and you take off out of Reedley, and you take off, and you call up the center, and you're flying along at 5,000 feet going to Sacramento, and their traffic controller is going to say, Tomahawk 3435 Juliet, I show you at 5,400 feet, and you're going to say, I'm at 5,000 feet. And they're going to say, what's your altimeter setting? The last altimeter setting you got was 29.97. And all of a sudden you reach, look up there and you realize you set it to 2.897. Of course, then it would be off about 1,000 feet. So you'd go, yeah, my, that's my fault, my bad, I'm fixing it. And you'd spin in the right altimeter and then you'd descend right away. And that, and, and as soon as they'd say, Roger, 3435 Juliet, and as soon as they let go of the key, they go, ha, ha. Don't worry, our drop controllers are nice. They're nice. They don't laugh when they're still holding the key down, right? Doesn't that mean they're nice? All right, so what that means is if you want to fly into Class Bravo airspace, Class B airspace, you not only have to have, not only do you have to have a two-way radio so you can talk to them, you got to have a transponder that transmits the altitude inside of your static system, and that's called mode C. On transponders, you can actually rotate the knob and turn it off so it won't transmit your altitude. But nobody flies around that way. Everybody turns it all the way over to the letter C. Okay, now, what I want you to do is pull out your chart, and I want you to look at San Francisco International Airport, and I want you to look for a very thin, light, magenta-covered circle around San Francisco International that's approximately 30 nautical miles from the middle of the airport. And it ought to go all the way around. And this is separate from telling you where Class B airspace is. This is called the Mode C Veil. What that means is if you fly within, inside of that, and just so you know, that ring is 30 nautical mile radius from the center of the airport. If you fly inside of that, even if you're underneath Class B airspace, you have to have a transponder and you have to transmit mode C. Even if you're not inside of the airspace, even if you're not talking to them. So you'll notice it goes way out into the water. So you have to go way out into the water to get around it. So if you if you lived at an airport, let's just say for fun, we go... Uh, south of San Francisco, and we go down to San Carlos Airport. It's about eight miles southeast of San Francisco International. It's our San Carlos Airport. You're actually underneath the Class C airspace, I think. Yeah. You have to have a mode C track because you're not in Class B airspace down in there. You're underneath the, the, the wedding cake, but you've got to have a mode C. So any of those airports, if you lived there, you'd have to get a mode C transponder in your airplane. The good news is these days, almost all airplanes have mode C transponders. Question, Brian? Yeah. Which circle? Yeah, here's, you, you brought up a good the question. Is it a little circle on the chart is the one got on the screen? And the answer is yes. The problem is that what I've got up there on the chart, this nice, very simple upside-down layer cake, all the mode, all the Class B airspaces in the United States, they're all different. They chop them up differently. There's an airport over here. They make it a little bigger over there or something like that. So the good news is, and I don't have any, is if there's a Class B airspace, you can get another chart that's and has lots more detail. So the sectional is one to 500,000, 
I think the terminal control, the, the, those terminals are 1 to 250. So it blows it up and everything's twice as big as this. Because look at what stuff is there on San Francisco. Half of it, you can't tell what is going on because there's too many lines being the same. So I would never fly into San Francisco unless I had one of these extra charts. And in fact, when we were on that spot in the last lecture, when I showed that screen, it's on the legend on the front of your chart there. Can I borrow this for a moment? Thanks, Mauricio. If you look on the front of your chart, all those purple squares, that's where they have the charts. Guess where the All of those are class B airspaces. I'd say I bet you. Did I answer your question okay? So, all right. So we know what a mode C veil is, and the fact that you've got to have a transponder inside of that 30 miles, even if you're on the outside of the class B airspace. And then you got to have a private pilot certificate to get into the class B airspace, not to fly underneath it. To fly underneath it, you can still be a student pilot. But if you want to fly into Class B airspace, you have to have at least a private pilot certificate. Now, there is an exception, and that is if your flight instructor flies with you, as you as a student pilot, you fly into that Class B airspace once and fly out of it, the instructor can then write in your logbook that it's okay for you to fly into Class B airspace. What's that? Uh, the instructor would write down how long it was good for, usually at 30 seconds. They're afraid after 90 days, they forget what they're doing. And then the instructor, because they'll, they'll call the instructor in there. Like whenever any of my students crashed, they always, when the FA called the student in, they always called me every single time. How many students did I crash? Oh, about one. I mean, my first students, only one of them. After that, none of them crashed. So I had I had a great you know one out of six. What's what's that about? Uh, is that about a is that like an eighty percent? So that's <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. We'll we'll talk about my student accident someday. Someday. All right. So quick review here. Class B airspace. The top of it, unless otherwise specified, it usually goes up to 10,000 feet, but you can see on your chart it would tell you how high it goes. Here's what's the thing I forgot to cover. Uh, if you're inside a Class B airspace, they are the air traffic controllers will keep you separated from all the other aircraft, even if you're VFR, even if the other craft are VFR. So it's, you're not an IFR aircraft, but now they're providing traffic separation like you were IFR, because remember, if you're IFR, they give you traffic separation from all other IFR traffic, but everyone who's in Class B airspace, whether you're IFR or VFR, everybody gets traffic separation from everybody. Now, they're still going to ask you to look out the window, but technically, they have share that responsibility as much or more than you do. And you got to get a clearance. If you fly into Class B airspace, literally, they're going to say, Tomahawk 3435 Juliet, you are cleared into Class Bravo airspace. They're going to use that word cleared, just like cleared to take off or cleared to land or cleared to cross a runway. They're going to use that word cleared. And, of course, you're smart. You're going to read Actum 3435 Juliet. It's cleared to enter Class Bravo airspace. Question, Brian? If you're not cleared, don't go. Yeah, you, you make a 90-degree turn and go left and go right. You could say, like, well, what's up, man? How come we can come in? <laughs> don't you like me anymore? I mean, maybe you don't want to use that same accent. But generally speaking, uh, they'll, uh, they would tell you why. And about the only reason I can think of at the moment is that they're so busy they, can't, they don't have time to talk to you. But that's never happened to me. I've probably flown into Class B airspace, I don't know, 20 30 times, and they've never said that to me. They've never said, oh, I don't have time to fiddle with it. And they wouldn't use fiddle. It, 
Jonathan, question? At Class B airspace is when all the airlines want to take off or when all the airlines want to land? Is when it's the busiest. So when do people want to fly airplanes? That's when the airlines try to schedule their flights. Usually, if you look at the busy airports, the takeoffs kick in around 6 a.m., and then they slow down a little tiny bit around 10, and then they start picking up again around 2 o'clock. But it varies. Cal California versus New York. Okay, if all the airplanes are taken off out of San Francisco between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., when are they getting into New York? So that's when it would get busy in New York. Am I answering your question? I want to know when it's get busy at Reedley. I'd say half of the airplane flights at Reedley have happen on Saturday. Because if you drive to Reedley Airport on Saturday, there's two or three airplanes out there doing something. But on the weekdays, it's dinner and a can of corned beef. Has anybody ever had a can of corned beef? All right, so they usually go up to 10,000 feet. Everybody gets traffic separation. You've got to have a clearance to get in. Of course, you've got to have a two-way radio. You've got to transmit with your mode C when you're in it. You've got to transmit on your mode C if you're within 30 nautical miles, even if you're not inside of it. And you've got to hold at least a private pilot certificate to go in there unless you're a student pilot and your instructor flies you through it once and then endorses you to do it. And it's got the basic shape of an upside-down wedding cake. And I think that is enough for one. Yeah.